If you're wondering, hey, shouldn't the next Goosebumps Monthly be The Beast from the East? I actually covered that book years ago, back when Goosebumps videos was a yearly affair and people got to vote for which book I covered. There's a link to the Beast from the East video in the description below. Alright, y'all ready to body shame some children? Today we're taking a look at Say, Cheese, and Die again, which is just begging for an Abbott and Costello routine. Hey Greg, what Goosebumps book are you talking about today? Say cheese and die again. Oh, you're giving it a second look? What? No, this is my first time reviewing it. But you said you're doing say cheese and die again. That's right. So you're doing it a second time. No, this is my first time. Then how are you doing it again? So the sequel to say cheese and die with all the same characters as before. Greg, Sherry, Bird, and Michael. Not too long after the events of the first book. Which surprised me. Goosebumps sequels tend to go one of two ways. Either you're following the characters facing new danger, like the Mummy books, or you're following new characters facing old dangers, like the Living Dummy series. I figured Say Cheese and Die would be in the latter category, new characters finding the supernatural camera that gives bad fates to whatever it takes a picture of. Part of the reason for that was because the first book ends with the two bully characters running off the camera, so, you know, it's on the move. And also, it's been a long time since the first book. This is the longest gap between a book and its sequel for the original Goosebumps series. Three years and seven months, a whole 40 books between the first and the second. We've all forgotten what happened in the first book. Let's just start fresh with new characters. And I guess Arlstein was worried about that time gap as well, but his solution was to spend the entirety of the first chapter recapping the first book as part of Greg's school assignment. Greg's class is taught by Mr... I, I think the book wants me to pronounce it Sour, because all the kids call him Sourball, but my brain just keeps reading it as Mr. Soar, because of Dinosaur. We'll go with Sour. Mr. Sour has tasked his students with telling a true story from their lives, and Greg decides to tell the story of the evil camera. A story which, in case you forgot, ends with a man's death. Greg doesn't get to that part though, because Mr. Sour stops him and chides Greg for not telling a true story, informing him that he's giving Greg an F. Mr. Sour is being a bit overly harsh, but come on Greg, you did this to yourself. Sure, it's a true story about a supernatural occurrence that few people witnessed and that you brought no proof of. What did you think was going to happen? What's more, Greg's grade in this class will determine if he gets to go to a nice summer vacation or not. Everything was at stake, Greg, and this is what you chose to do? This isn't just a convenient way to recap the first story. This is our inciting incident. If Greg is to save his grade, he needs to prove the story is true. And the best way to do that is to find the evil camera. Now, if you think that means tracking down the two bullies from the first book, they're a complete no-show here. We do have a couple of new bullies, though, Donnie and Brian. And here's where things start to get ugly. Brian and Donnie are the two biggest guys at Pitt's Landing Middle School. We call them Sumo 1 and Sumo 2, because they're both shaped a little like sumo wrestlers. Of course, no one has ever called them Sumo 1 or Sumo 2 to their faces. When Donnie and Brian get angry, they sit on kids and squash them like bugs. I'm afraid to say this is not a one-off moment of making fat jokes and using body weight as a negative signifier. This is the book's main shtick. After discussing it with his friends, Greg decides to sneak out in the middle of the night and return to the house where they originally found and left the camera only to discover that the house has been sold and completely demolished. While looking through the site, Greg runs into a kid named John, the son of the property's new owner. John lets Greg look around for a bit, and they eventually find the camera, underneath a raccoon carcass. That's... gross. Greg has a hard time explaining the camera to John, and in the hubbub accidentally snaps a photo of the boy. The picture comes out of John with a giant nail run through his foot, and as you might expect, a few moments later, my breath caught in my chest. I stumbled forward through the weeds and saw John holding his sneaker, his face twisted in pain. Even in the dim moonlight, I could see the huge nail pushing up through his foot. Well, that's a bit more violent than the books usually go for. 
John's dad shows up and takes John to the hospital. So Greg has the camera back and he takes it to school the next morning. Sherry confronts him, rightfully calling him out for bringing something so dangerous to school. The two fight over it, and Greg once again accidentally presses the shutter, taking a picture of Sherry. However, instead of the usual foreboding Polaroid, the picture is a negative. Who knows what that can mean? Sherry, upset, grabs the camera and takes Greg's picture as revenge. I gripped the snapshot with both hands. I recognized my face, but I didn't recognize my body. At first I thought my head was resting on top of a giant balloon. Then I realized that the giant balloon was me. In the photo, I weighed about 400 pounds. No joke, 400 pounds! I gaped at the photo, studying my round face and my even rounder body. I had eight chins. My cheeks were puffed. No, no, no. Fuck this. I know this video series is meant for adults about books that would have been read 25 years ago, but I am not going to quote this book anymore. It's fucking gross. Fuck you, R.L. Stein, and your lavishly detailed fat shaming. Fuck you. Fuck this book. I've quoted enough. Everyone gets the idea. Fuck you, R.L. Stein. All this fuss is for naught anyway, since Mr. Sauer is out sick for the day and his class has a substitute teacher. The day passes and Greg starts to feel weird, like his clothes are getting tighter. And when he gets on his bike, his tires pop. The kid hasn't gained enough weight yet to go up a pant size, but I guess he's fat enough that he can't ride a bicycle. Yes, Stein, teach kids that the line between functional and dysfunctional is a matter of five pounds. Make them feel like shit over the most minute changes in weight. Things are much more notable the next morning, with Greg already ripping out of his pajamas like the Incredible Hulk. Mom reacts by putting skim milk in Greg's cereal. <laughs> Your son clearly has a serious medical condition. Mr. Sauer is back in class that day and immediately gives a nasty comment about Greg's weight. Greg tries once again to convince Mr. Sauer about the camera, bringing both the camera and the picture of John with a nail through his foot, but of course it's not going to convince the teacher. Nothing short of a demonstration would, and Greg knows better than that. Oh, and Greg gets stuck in his chair because lol fat people. Sherry is having her own problems. She's getting thinner, because that's what a negative photograph means? After about a dozen more weight jokes, Greg and Sherry start to work out a plan. Now, in the first book, it seemed that tearing up the photos reversed their effects, and they consider that this time, but think it might do them harm. So instead, they go to the photo store where Greg's older brother, Terry, works. The idea? Turn Greg's photo into a negative, and Sherry's negative into a regular photo. I'll admit, I'm not a photography expert, but I'm pretty confident this isn't a thing. You don't convert a negative photo into a positive photo through alchemy or whatever. You use the negative to make a positive copy. Which my gut tells me isn't enough to appease the evil demons that control this camera, since it wouldn't affect the original photographs in any way. In any case, Terry pops into the back, throws some chemicals on the photo or something, we don't really get to see it, and there you go. Sherry's photo is now positive, and Greg's photo is now a negative. And the next morning, would you look at that? It works. Greg and Sherry are back to their original weight. But Greg is still very upset with Mr. Sauer. So he decides to take the teacher's picture with the camera. You know, roll the dice. See if it kills him. So Greg brings the camera to school again. But before he can murder the man, Mr. Sauer snatches it from his hand and takes a picture of the entire class. The book ends with our cast of characters waiting to see how the photo develops. God damn, is this just the grossest Goosebumps book ever. And I don't mean, ew, fat people are gross. I mean, it's easily the most morally repugnant book the series has ever produced. A book about feeling ashamed about your body. A book that uses different body types as moral punishment. For children. This book does kids dirty in a number of ways. It makes a younger reader super conscious of their body and their weight. The book might make them feel that having a larger body type means they're freakish and wrong. If a kid already has body image issues because society is awful, being shown gaining weight as a supernatural punishment isn't gonna help with that. And the book encourages laughing at people's weight. If you're already a bit of a bully, 
This book doubles as a joke book, so you can throw fat jokes at the kids at school. We've had plenty of bad Goosebumps books before this, but this is the first and hopefully only book in this series that's actively harmful. Can you handle these subject matters delicately? Sure, with care and a deft hand. Unfortunately, R.L. Stein is a bad writer. He is a bad, shitty writer. I don't have much of a rewrite for you guys this time. This whole book just needs to be chucked in the trash. Start over from scratch. The only confident note I have is that this needs to be a sequel with new characters who don't already know how the camera works. As is, with Greg fully aware that the thing can kill people, you basically have a book about a kid bringing a gun to school. It makes it really hard to like these kids when they're playing around with something they know to be incredibly dangerous. The innocence of new characters would prevent that problem. But beyond that, just burn it to the ground. This book sucks. I hate Goosebumps. No rating. I'm out. Uh, the next one's a camp book. The camp books tend to be pretty good. It better be pretty good. I'm gone. Later. Bye. I love you.